Okay, we're done with the buildings, and now one of my favorite parts is fracturing the helicopter. Uh, why favorite? I really, really love fracturing uh, geometry, especially such complex geometries as cars or helicopters or planes, because there is some planning that we need to do beforehand, but if we do it well, then the task is actually pretty simple. So what you see on the left is the groups that we have that come from the helicopter geometry. We already have separated uh, propellers, the glass. Remember, we've created some groups manually. For example, this uh, base for the propeller. And we have the wheels separated and the uh, uh, car doors or helicopter doors. We will need to do some more separation manually, uh, but we'll get through that in a second. So what we'll have is separate fractures for glass, for the front rotor, it's this one on top, for the rear rotor, for the wheels, small parts. You will see there is actually a bunch of nuts and bolts and small items like this. Then we have the what we call large metal is the, uh, the body of the helicopter and the inside large parts. If I go into wireframe mode, you see actually there is some uh, inside of the helicopter model. So we have some chairs, we have some panels. So it will be nice, I think, for the shot if, for example, during the explosion, we have one of the chairs falling out as a whole. Um, things like that. So first, let's uh, think what we need to take into consideration. For example, for the glass, if you look at our references, uh, you will see that Black Hawk helicopter, its windows are made of actually plexiglass. And this plexiglass, upon impact, it does not fract uh, it does not shatter into pieces, and pieces don't normally fly off. The glass itself usually stays together. Uh, but what we will see is very interesting fracture lines. So this is something we will try to recreate. So the idea here is, as the explosion happens, the glass is going to fracture. We will see the lines, and it's going to fly out of uh, the, and it's going to fly out of its sockets outwards. Then we have uh, both rotors which need to continue rotating after the fracture, so we need to set up constraints accordingly. Then we have the wheels. We are not going to simulate the deformation of the tire or, thing, or anything like that. We will treat it much simpler. The wheels can just come off the body. That's it. Because uh, all of the shots in the sequence, let's imagine none of them are too close up. All the helicopters are pretty far away from the camera. Then we have all the small details that I showed you earlier, all those nuts and bolts. What we will do is we will allow them to get released upon the impact during the first frames of the explosion. This will give us really nice uh, sense of something really strong and impactful happening when we have a lot of small and medium-sized uh, items uh, flying off with great speed. Um, then the idea is to have the back side of the helicopter, this tail part, it should stay intact, it should stay attached to the helicopter. Let's look to, uh, at a few references, and what you will notice is in some of them, the back of the helicopter uh, the back of the tail actually falls off or breaks off, but in some it stays attached to the body. So this is more of a creative choice, which round, uh, which way we want to go. And I'm making an executive creative decision that in our case, the tail stays attached to the body. But we still want to allow it to bend because it is metal. So we will need to set up proper constraints where uh, metal can bend. Then uh, I remember our brief when we were told that the front of the helicopter needs to completely detach this front part and needs to fly off and hit the building, which means that we need a uh, quite detailed fracture on the front so that it can shatter into small pieces. And inside the cabin, as I told you already, we will have some chairs, for example, um, still intact or not broken apart so that when the front detaches, we don't want just a bunch of small pieces flying off. We want a combination of smaller and larger pieces and maybe whole seats. Then we cover the whole range and our shot will look interesting. Okay, I think we are ready to get started. 
let's take a look at our helicopter here. This is our animated helicopter that it's flying in space. Let's time shift it to the first frame and then let's bring it to the center of the world. Let's bring it back to our rest position. It's always a good practice to do all your fracturing at the center of the world. Let's dive in and here we have our glass separated. So first let's take care of the glass fracture. But before we even continue, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a name attribute on those glass panels. If I go to my primitive geometry spreadsheet, I can see that I have glasses, glass from 0 to 16. So 16 unique names, which means that uh, anytime there is a piece that belongs to any of those glass panels, I will know which panels it belongs to. And let's just store this name attribute into an attribute called name original, name array. So um, if it happens that my name gets changed, I still store this value. Then let me just put my uh, Houdini on manual and I double check that I have one pass selected. Yes, let me show you how we are fracturing our glass. I will give it a second to compute and show you the result. Okay, so let's look at our result. That's the fracture lines we have. This is what we were talking about earlier, that uh, plexiglass fractures in a particular way. Let's look again at our reference. This is uh, something similar that we're trying to replicate. So let's see how we are doing it here. We are taking a glass uh, panel, we are moving it to the center of the world, then we are extracting a centroid. I'm using a new option in the method by convex hull center. This is a new option from Houdini 20. After that, I am creating a random orient attribute and so that we have the orientation of the cutters every time different. After that, I'm creating a point replicate. So out of one point, I've just created 50 different points with the shape of a sphere. But what I'm doing is I'm taking advantage of this uh, iteration that we selected earlier. Remember, it was our fourth iteration. I'm using this meta node and I'm just referencing the uh, iteration attribute from a uh, detail iteration attribute from our meta uh, import node. If you look at it here, here is our iteration. That's what I'm referencing, which means with every iteration, we'll have a random seed here. And here we have our cutters. We have a grid that is remeshed and then some noise added to it. And the noise also takes advantage of those iterations, which means with every iteration, the noise on the grid is going to be different. This way, when I copy the cutters, the way they're copied depends on the orientation. So with change of this orientation, uh, they're going to be this way, this way, this way, this way, or this way. So I'll random every single time. And then I'm using those cutters in a Boolean fracture. And this is what I get. This kind of uh, lines, that's exactly what I wanted. Then I'm using match size to bring my geometry back where it was before, because when I used the first match size, I turned on stash transform, which means the position where it was before, uh, this geometry remembered it. So now when I'm using match size, I'm saying restore the transform bring me back where I started from. And after that, our Boolean fracture, if you look at the geometry spreadsheet, here it creates um, a name attribute and now we have 278 pieces. But remember when we want this piece of glass to participate in the simulation, we want it to be treated as a whole piece. That's why I'm taking back the name and bringing it back to the original name. So now I have, this is glass four, that's it. And now this is, uh, this is my glass fracture. After that, just for a good measure, I'm good doing some clean. Let me just turn, uh, I'm cleaning it up. And then uh, what I'm doing is I'm storing a value from RBD connected faces. If you worked with the glass fracturing before, you already know what it does. It actually takes the inside faces that we have here, this geometry, and it remembers the distance of those inside faces between the pieces. Uh, 
And this is very useful when you want to render glass, because before the glass shatters, you want those surfaces to be invisible. And this is what we'll use it for later. So we remember that. And while we are at it, let's create our proxy geometry. So I'm using convex decomposition, and I'm going quite high in my concavity so that I have this um, curved geometry preserved. After that, I'm just doing RBD pack. Oh, there are no constraints here because remember, this is going to be a solid piece. So I'll just have my beautiful original geometry and my proxies. I'm creating a group for it that I call glass and I am caching it. So this, I'm already loading my cache. If I look at it wireframe mode, all of my uh, glass panels, they have different fractures, different directions, thanks to our random orient. And after that, let me just go to the first frame. I created a little example for you to double check that the intended um, shapes are working how we want them to work in the simulation. So you can see the pieces are falling and they are interacting in the manner how we would expect them to. So you see the pieces, the curved geometry is treated as such. What we are doing here is just I'm doing RBD unpack. I'm unpacking my geometry. I'm doing a very simple RBD configure where I simply uh, adjust the collision padding and adjust my type of the geometry to glass. And then I just run it through the solver.